Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. This is God's word. James writes to persecuted and dispersed Christians, and he tells them one simple message, be patient. This morning, I want us to look at this text, and I want you to be patient as we walk through this text, because this is a lot of verses. I usually don't cover this many verses. I like one verse, and I like to preach for 45 minutes. But today, we have verses 7 through 12, and you're going to need to be patient, because we're also going to have the Lord's Supper afterwards. This might stretch to an hour and 20 minutes. Be patient today. But we're here to worship the Lord, so let's worship Him. I want us to see from this text this morning, number one, patient. That's the first point, point patient. Number two, presence. Number three, proper speech. Just three easy points. Patient, presence, proper speech. Let's dive into this text and see what James has to teach us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go back and look at verses 7 and 8 with me. He says, be patient. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. What is James verse's words? Be patient. He gives a triple exhortation to patience. What is patience? It's the ability to wait. The old timers called this long suffering. And the Greek verb here means to be patient under extended and lengthened afflictions without murmuring. What is your first response when you have to walk through something that you don't like? You murmur. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Bunch of murmurs. That's what we really are. And the Reverend Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, said that murmuring is the devil's music. He loves for us to murmur. To grumble and complain against afflictions and things that maybe are make us a little uncomfortable. Remember, I, I hasten to say this again, but James is not writing to you first and foremost. He's writing to persecuted Christians. It looks to me that at, we as Christians in 2023, we're not really persecuted. We walked in here by our own volition. We're able to sit down. Many of you can get up and leave when the service is over. We're not persecuted. But these brothers and sisters were persecuted, and he tells them to be patient. James has the audacity to tell someone who's in a bad situation to be patient. He started the whole letter this way. He said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, how many of you in here have been tested over the last year? In 2022, maybe the Lord told you to be patient. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to walk you through affliction, a trial. Uh, but in the middle of that trial, I want you to count it all joy. Because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And usually we grumble and murmur. James says, take the murmuring and replace it with thanksgiving. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Memorize that. That should be our Bible verse for 2023. Give thanks in all circumstances. Not some, not half, but all circumstances. But because of our sinful tendencies, we would rather murmur and complain and grumble. James says, 
be patient. But James is a guy who's very practical, so he gives us some examples here. The first example is a farmer. A farmer goes out, he tills up the land, he throws the seed, he covers it back over, he waters, he waters, he hopes, he prays that the sun will come out. And then at some undisclosed time in the future, he'll have a harvest. Now, what's happening while that seed is germinating in the ground? The farmer's faith is growing. He has to place his faith and trust in something, hoping by faith that in the future there will be a harvest that he'll actually be able to see with his own eyes. And this actually takes the farmer through seasons. And seasons means waiting, doesn't it? Be patient. Well, what about the crops? Because too many of us would just look at the farmer, think about the crop for a second. Well, the text talks about it. Go back and look at it. It says the early and the late rains come upon those crops. The early rains, they helped to start the process. The late rains finished the process, and it is a process. That's why the Lord, when he calls us to himself, starts a process. And the process is a growth process. Sometimes he stretches you, sometimes he comforts you. Here, the crops need something that starts and helps to finish the process. And the Bible tells us that he who began a good work in you will see it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Be patient. Now, how can they be a patient here? I mean, this is a tough calling for us in an Amazon.com world, isn't it? I can order something today, and in two days it'll arrive at my house. Well, how can these dear Christians who are being persecuted be patient? We'll go back and look at the text. Look at verse 8. It says, establish your hearts. What does it mean to establish your hearts? It means to be fully convinced of something. It means to be dogmatic about something. Where that you're not going to waver or vacillate. You know, there will be all sorts of vicissitude in this life. You're going to walk through ups and downs. But you have to stay anchored to something. Preferably, something that's eternal and not earthly. Because everything in this world is eternally out of date. You're made out of dust, and to dust you shall return. What are you anchored to? That's what James is really calling these brothers and sisters too. I mean, these are almost similar to the Apostle Paul's language in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Be strong. Stand. And when you can't stand anymore, keep on standing. That's the way Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 6. Keep standing. Well, what are they supposed to establish their hearts on? This is point number two, presence. Go back, look at the text. He says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He's going to talk about presence here. And maybe you say, I don't see presence anywhere in the text, Meg. Well, it's a little veiled. But when he uses the word coming of the Lord, it's actually the Greek phrase parousia. Maybe you're familiar with it. This would have had greater significance to the first century readers. See, parousia means presence. But in the first century, any time a king was going to visit a city, well, his presence was coming to that city, and they would prepare the city for his arrival. Any dignitary was well known. They would prepare, and they would actually put together what are called parousia coins so they could mark off his visit to their city. You'll remember there were times in the past where we've had presidents fly into Dobbins to come and visit us and they shut down the roads. You can't drive down 41 or any other interstate. It's painful. But archeologists have actually done digs and they have found these parousia coins when Nero actually visited Corinth. The presence. The parousia, 
Establish your hearts on the parousia, the second coming of Christ. Now, I know this is old fundamentalist teaching, isn't it? But it's biblical. Even now today, some of you have been Christians for 50, 60, 70 years. You've heard that sermon. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And you're at the tail end of your days and you're thinking, he's not coming back. He's coming back. His presence how many of you have ever been in the room with someone that you really respect? You, you've never met them, but you're looking forward to being in that same room. Your hearts get a little giddy. Why don't we have the same giddiness about the Lord Jesus Christ? This was a downfall of the reformers. They didn't do enough with the book of Revelation to actually see that Christ really is coming back and we're going to be in his presence and we'll see him face to face and we will see him as we are. We're going to see him unveiled. This is what we should establish our hearts to in 2023. That he really is coming back. Will he come back in 2023? No man knows. And when you find one who says he knows, run from that person. He's a crazy lunatic. He has no idea. But do you trust God at his word? Because the, the question was, did God really say? That's where we got in trouble a long time ago. That's where we still get in trouble today. And from the scripture, when Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels said, the way in which he went away, he'll come back the exact same way. You will see him. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. He will come back. We don't know when, but we know that he is going to come. Now look back at verse 7 with me. It says, until the coming of the Lord. How can these Christians who are being persecuted... How can we as Christians persevere? How can we be patient? Well, did you see the conjunction there? Go back, look at the text. It says, until. Circle that. Until. What's God the Holy Spirit telling us? Your afflictions, your suffering, won't last forever. It will not follow you into eternity. It's only until the coming of the Lord. Maybe you say, that's not really helpful for me today. Well, the Bible tells us that God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in our affliction. He does it now, but more fully in the days ahead. Don't you think that Daniel in the lion's den was scratching his head saying, God, where are you? Those teeth look a lot more real than you do at this point. Some of you may be in the lion's den today. Maybe some of you be in the lion's den in just a couple of short weeks. Who knows? But those whom God would use mightily, he will wound deeply. Think about Job. Did God love Job? Yeah. Did Job have an easy breezy life? No. But if we jump to the New Testament, Paul, was his life fine? Everything was great? It was okay? No. He walked through suffering. Oh, the Lord Jesus Christ. What about him? You see, there are some Christian sects that say we should just come to faith in Christ and everything is going to be okay. I am happy all the day. There are some days that I'm angry. I'm ticked off. Some days when things are happening in my life, I don't like it. Think about these persecuted Christians. All of God's people at some level have been men of sorrow, acquainted with grief. But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we wait, as we long and we look to the things that are unseen, hmm, we walk by faith and not by sight. We look for those things that are to come. And here the Bible holds out for us a promise and says that there is something more glorious and grand than anything that you ever could experience in this life. Well, is that it? Establish your hearts on the coming of the Lord. Thanks, we've heard that message a thousand times. No, go back to the text. He says, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ will come back. 
Bible tells us in 1 Peter 4, 5 that he will judge the living and the dead. He will judge. All things will be set straight. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. That's Jesus' words. The real judge who wears the long black robe, the one who actually sits on the highest of authority, he's coming back to judge. He's going to set all things straight. All the injustice that you've experienced, that I've experienced in life, all the things that we've done against other people, it's all going to be set straight. That's scary on the one hand and comforting on the other because there are none who are righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned. And here he says the judge is standing at the door. Wasn't it the same language in 1 Thessalonians? Paul said he's coming. He's coming back. Soon he'll come back. Oh, but wait a second. See, we get confused because of sin. And we think Jesus is going to come back on our timetable. You know, i got a calendar, Jesus, and this week i got this going on. Don't interrupt it. You can come back the next week, but not this week. What do you think about the story of John the Baptist? It's, a, it's kind of a funny story when you look in the details. But John is preaching repentance. He's like the prophets of old. He's preaching against the sin of the world, and they throw him in prison. Well, where's Jesus when John's in prison? Well, Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, here's what we find. It says, Now when he, Jesus, heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. I don't know if you've looked at a map recently, um, but Capernaum is 115 miles north of Machaerus. Machaerus is in a desert prison. That's where John's locked up. Where does Jesus go? 115 miles north to the beach. <laughs> Do you see the irony? But you see, it's the same way for us. We think that Jesus has to beat our every beck and call to fix every single situation that maybe ruffles our feathers. And John is stuck in prison. And John calls and says, is he the Messiah, or is there another one? And then he's beheaded. While Jesus is doing a beach ministry, he is the Lord. He is in control. Yes, he is coming back to set all things straight, but he tells us, be patient. What are we to do while we're trying to be patient? And we're waiting for his presence. Well, I'll go back to the text. This is proper speech. Look at verses 9 through 12. He says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. What's the first thing to go when we are walking through affliction and suffering and unwanted circumstances? What's the pressure release valve? It's our tongues. You let somebody have it. You start speaking bitterly toward someone as if they were your dog. And I know people who treat their dogs better than they do their spouse. James says here, our speech reveals our hearts. Our speech tells a lot about what's going on inside of us. And here he says, do not grumble against one another, brothers. Do you know what grumbling is? Grumbling is a 100-foot billboard that says, welcome to hell, everything revolves around me. I'm so important. Look at me. I'm going to grumble against you and you and you and you because you should be serving me. And Paul says in Ephesians 4, 2, that we are to bear with one another in love. 
to guard our mouths. You remember what happened to Peter when he got in a tight situation. Yes, he denied Jesus three times. Here's actually what we find in Matthew 26, 74. It says, then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Peter is a little capricious, but he's just like us. You find yourself in a tight situation, and then you have loose lips. And you let people have it. And words do matter, especially against your brothers and your sisters those who you say you love and those who are closest to you, be careful how you speak to them because your words really do matter. This is why the scripture tells us that fathers are not to provoke their children, but to bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. If they've been given grace, then fathers should spew grace towards their kids, towards their wives, I mean, this is Ephesians chapter 5, just played out in one small little verse. But then James gives us two examples. He talks about the prophets and Job. What about the prophets? Well, they were not perfect people, but they were given a message to preach about the wrath of God that was to come. They had to walk through fiery trials. Can you imagine if you're in the Old Testament and you saw Isaiah walk in the door or Jeremiah? <laughs> people were like, Oh, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to be around him. We know what he's going to say. He has one message. He's a one-trick pony. He's going to call us out for our sin. And the prophets were steadfast. They were patient. The Bible tells us that Jeremiah was hunted down by a wild boar. Ezekiel suffered pain from persecution. Daniel was thrown into lion's den. Isaiah preached the message. He was constantly rejected. And they spoke in the name of the Lord and they watched their mouths. They spoke and they gave what God had given them to speak. And sometimes it is truth. We like to rush to the grace part, but it's truth. Sometimes you need to hear truth. Actually, you need to hear the truth all the time. Because you hear a lot of fake news everywhere else. He also gives us the example of Job. Job, that servant who did not listen to the voice of his wife when she told him, curse God and die. He wasn't perfect, but he watched his speech. He watched how he spoke to his friends. And I don't know about you, but if you read the text closely, he has three friends that are idiots. And he still has to speak to them in a nice way. He watches his speech. Do you know that person? The person you know who's coming to you, you're, they're about to say something. You're like, this is going to be outlandish. It's going to be ridiculous. They have nothing nice to say. And that was Job's three best friends. I'd get three new best friends if I were Job. But he watched his mouth, didn't he? And amazingly enough, in Job 42.10, here's what we find. It says, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. He prayed for these people. The ones who really didn't encourage Job, he prays for them. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. He was patient and he used proper speech. James concludes this and says, Do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. What's he doing? He's just plagiarizing his big brother Jesus who taught the exact same thing. That as people speak to you, say yes, say no. How many people in our day are really good politicians? They like to massage, manipulate words. You ask them a question, they're not gonna answer it head on. They're going to dance around it as much as possible. James says, when we're speaking to our brothers and sisters, let us say yes or no. Why? Well, look back at the text. He answers it. He said, where well, you might fall under condemnation. You might get yourself in trouble. You might lie. You might stretch the truth. And then there will be friction between you and your brother. You see what James is trying to do? He's trying to take their focus away from the persecution, 
focus it on the Lord and his presence and knowing that we will stand in his presence and he as the judge one day, it should change how we interact with one another. We should definitely love one another, be open to one another, to speak to one another in such a way that our yeses are yes and our no is no, so that there is no condemnation. Therefore, James has told us that we need to be patient, waiting for the presence of the Lord. And while we're doing this, to use proper speech. Be patient. How can we be patient? Well, how many of you have gone to a wedding recently and someone's read 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient. Have you ever noticed how that's a noun? Paul's thinking of someone. And he's thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ as being patient. Yes, he was very God and very man. And in his humanity, he lived out 30 years where he was patient. He goes for three years in his ministry before he is executed. He's patient. And Jesus Christ, in his humanity, as he's on the cross, and in that garden before the cross, he's being patient. He's trusting the Lord, his plan. He has to trust the Father just like you and I have to trust him today. We're called as Christians to trust to be patient to the coming of the Lord. And Jesus' words in Revelation 22, 20 says, Surely I am coming soon. Again, that's another promise for you and I to hold on to today. Surely I am coming soon. Some of you have been waiting for 50 and 60 and 70 years. Thank you for your witness to us. Some of us have only been a Christian for a year or two, and man, we are so impatient. But help us as younger people to look to the older as a witness, to see how the older have been waiting for so long for the coming of the Lord. It's hard in our day to be patient, isn't it? We have everything at our fingertips. You have drive through windows for everything. And those are actually out of date now because now you can just order it on an app. And the Bible is telling us something crazy this morning, to be patient. You know, this might be a good message for us in 2023, to be patient. Some of us may have plans, may want to see things happen, may want to do this, may want to do that. Um, be patient. Be patient. Be patient. How can you do that? Well, you know that the Lord Jesus Christ was ultimately patient for you and for me so that for eternity we will be in his presence. But until we are in his presence fully, let us use proper speech amongst ourselves. Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray.